Welcome to Walk in the Park. My name is Tony Ingram, your host, and today is, let's go here, episode 85, so recorded on September 3rd, 2014. And if you want to see all of my episodes, you can go to my vid blog at walkinpark.com and uh, find them. This one will be up there in a few days. This is actually going to first be shown on September 4th. Okay. Today, we are going to go to the Catskill Mountains in eastern New York. And uh, let's take a look at a map of New York State here, showing two large parks, Adirondack Park and Catskill Park. Now, we think of state parks like around Ithaca, Taganic Falls, and Buttermilk Falls. These are older parks that uh, were created by acts of the state constitution and they have a little bit different management and so forth and they're also some of the largest parks uh, the Adirondack Park is actually one of the largest parks in the country and Catskill Park is good size too but obviously much smaller than Adirondack Park so we're gonna go to Catskill Park let's zoom in on a map of that and you can see that there's a uh, different colored areas within the park boundary that light blue line outlines the park boundary of Catskill Park but the white areas are actually all private land that are all managed within the unit management boundaries so there's it's sort of a kind of a zoning classification for Catskill Park. The Adirondack Park has the same thing and then the green areas are different classifications of forest preserve which is protected by the state constitution you basically have to leave it alone this is all uh, established back in the late 1800s uh, the protection of these lands in response to uh, very destructive logging practices and so forth that uh, conservationists in New York um, did some groundbreaking uh, um, legislation to protect land. So I draw in from the west into the park boundary and this is what you see. You'll see a sign like this and then not much more and you'll go through and occasionally you'll see a trail or you'll see other some other kind of sign but it's not like a uh, another state park or national park or something like that where you see a lot of uh, uh, park facilities and guidance and so forth. Uh, I went to the northeastern part of the park and you can see it has uh, names for different woods there. The, the dark green is, is, uh, indicates what have been designated as wilderness areas. The light green is wild forest. And you see up in the upper right Wyndham Blackhead Range and then the right lower right it says Catterskill and then there's a darker area just between those two and that's actually a uh, intensive use area uh, a campground and day use area called the North Lake South Lake public campground and day use area so it's kind of like one of our state parks and you actually have to pay to get into this area and uh, they have a swimming and so forth I camped there for several nights last week and it was a lot of fun. I'd been there a few years ago and I really liked the place and there's some great hiking trails and so forth. So, uh, so we're gonna uh, take a look around the North Lake, South Lake area and some of the amazing things that are there and a lot of history. We'll take, uh, go up to what's called Sunrise Rock, or Sunset Rock, excuse me, because <laughs> it's looking to the west and southwest. Um, I didn't ta uh, take this picture this time. I took it a few years ago, the last time I was there. Look, looking over in the um, left is North Lake, and in the upper center is South Lake. They're actually connected, so it's two lakes, but they're really kind of one. And that lake, those are natural lakes uh, created by the glaciers, and uh, people have been enjoying them for a couple hundred years. So let's go take another look. Uh, this is farther up, actually, on a um, trail up to what's called North Point, and we'll go up to that trail uh, in a little bit here but another perspective on North Lake to the left and South Lake to the right. And then the ridge that's right behind them is called the called, uh, South Mountain. And then you look to the, uh, well, let's go over to the left here. That's North Lake. You may be able to notice there's a beach there. And then just to the left of that, the hill just drops off, drops off over 2,000 feet down to the Hudson Valley. So that's the Hudson Valley out there. And the stream, extreme upper left actually is the Hudson River, which is at sea level. So this is a little over 2,000 feet elevation here, looking from uh, at the level of North Lake along the little trail there. And this is the swimming area, and it's very nice. A lot of people come up there during the summer. 
So um, I decided to go for a hike. I've been some other hikes around there, but I hiked up to a place I hadn't been to before. So I headed up to something called North Point, which I just mentioned. So we'll start that hike. Uh, the trail signs around, the trail markers are little colored discs, different uh, colors for different uh, trails. And I hit up, it's about a mile and three quarters or so in total up to uh, North Point. Starting off a waterfall called Ashley Falls, but being August, there's not as much water as you'll find, say, in May or June. Here's a tra uh, trail bridge over. Um, the creek that actually goes over that waterfall. And this is the top of the waterfall. Not a lot of water going over. That actually drops down quite a lot there. Not sure, maybe 50 feet or something. And uh, it is wet over in the dark in the right there. And there was a little bit of water coming down. But uh, not like we're uh, seeing around here in the Finger Lakes, which I guess we've had maybe a wetter summer. I'm not sure. But in any case, that was kind of dry. So from there on, it's kind of a steep hike up through the woods. Lots of rocks. Not our um, groomed trails around here with steps and so forth made by the, um, uh, the state parks, which are nice. But um, And even our um, Finger Lakes Trail is not as rough as this. Uh, we seem to have less exposed rock or rock that isn't quite as close to the surface. And maybe there are harder rocks down there, over there in the Catskills. There are. There's certainly a lot of sandstone and, and uh, it's called conglomerate, very tough rocks. So it was a lot of um, rocky going, going up steep slopes. Glad I had my walking stick with me. And uh, this was more of a challenge than I expected it to be. It wasn't that long of a hike, and it wasn't that high, maybe seven or, seven or 800 feet in elevation. But it was actually quite a lot of work. And I got my first viewpoint up on North Point, looking back to the lakes and South Mountain. And let's see. So I climbed up, got up on North Point, got some more views. Here we are again from a, there's ledges up there. Now it's called a point because there's several points like this. There's a stopple point, which is farther along. And these are points of land of the Catskills as they, as they um, uh, loom over the Hudson Valley. And the Hudson Valley is up there, the upper left there. And it's uh, maybe 3,000 feet elevation there where I am. And it's sea level at the Hudson River. The Hudson River, a little bit hard to see in this picture, but maybe we'll see it in some other ones better. But uh, the Catskills just drop right off, all, all along what the geologists call the Catskill Mural Front. So um, another view from the ledges up on uh, North Point. Again, you can see the lakes. You can see it, I don't know whether that's Round Top or Catterskill High Peak there in the center. Um, okay, another view over there. You can see where it drops off. And then looking directly east, this is a point that sticks out, a lower elevation point that sticks out below North Point and then drops off to the Hudson Valley. So that's pretty cool. So let's see where we're going to go next. So then I'm going to turn around. I was looking for a view that I had read about in the guidebook of mountains that I'm really fond of. And uh, so I went around to the north part of North Point. You can just see these mountains that you can see just left of center there. Uh, that drop off very dramatically. Zoom in a little bit on them. And that is the Blackhead um, Black Dome range of mountains, Blackhead Mountains, which are almost 4,000 feet high, yet they drop off, drop off down to the Hudson Valley, uh, like I said, down to sea level. So this was actually at the end of my trip, I uh, endeavored to get a uh, perspective from a lower elevation of those same mountains. And this is on New York State Route 23, heading east from, no, I'm sorry, west from Catskill, New York. And uh, those are those same mountains as they're dropping off towards the Hudson. So uh, maybe a 3,000 foot descent from this mountain going down here. So that's pretty dramatic landscape in some of the highest mountains in the Catskills, in the northeast Catskills there. But uh, remember, I hadn't actually left North Point there. And I uh, began back down the trail. There were some level sections, which were nice, but then other sections that were real rocky. This was fairly steep. And look at all that rock that your feet have to um, negotiate. A lot of it because there's been so many people on the trail that, that water uh, flows down the trail and it washes out all of the um, 
soil between the rocks. So you get the trails often, it's in the Adirondacks too, they often become these rock rubble roots that you have to be very careful on your footing. And there are ledges to descend and ascend, depending which way you're going, and uh, interesting uh, rock features. So very good to have a walking stick, especially for the likes of me at my age. I used to have much better balance when I was a young man bounding around these mountains, which I no longer do. I walk carefully and slowly. And uh, finally getting lower down near Ashley Falls, and it was getting late afternoon at this point, and it was nice light in the woods. So, um, so that's a nice perspective of the North Lake, South Lake area and the edge of the Catskills where they drop off to the Hudson Valley. But the next morning, I went over to another feature that's very famous, and this is the top of a waterfall called Catterskill Falls. And if you look on the left, lower left of this picture, you can see a little waterfall. And it's actually a big waterfall, but it doesn't have a lot of water in it. It's, it's uh, kind of like Taganic. Here's a picture I took six years ago, I think. Yeah, when I was there in August, not a lot of water again in the falls. But this waterfall, the two drops are actually taller than Taganic Falls. This is some 260 feet, Catterskill Falls, once thought to be the tallest waterfall in New York State. Here's a photograph taken by a guy. Let me see what's his name here. Wrote it down. Um, Dean Goss, it's on his website, he has a neat website, northeastwaterfalls.com, northeastwaterfalls.com. So he's got a lot of interesting pictures and information on him. And um, let's see, the upper falls drops 180 feet, and the lower falls another 80 feet, so something like 260 foot high total drop, whereas Taganic Falls is 215 feet, but it's all in one drop, which is taller than either one of those drops. So, does that make it, uh, does that make uh, Catterskill Falls the tallest waterfall in New York State? No, it isn't actually. There are at least three other waterfalls that are 300 feet or taller. One's called Tea Lake Falls in the Adirondacks, in Inspiration Falls, which is in Letchworth State Park, and then there's another waterfall in the state called Roaring Brook Falls. Inspiration Falls, by the way, is 350 feet high and Roaring Brook, Fall, Brook, Roaring Brook Falls, which I think might also be in the Adirondacks, 325 feet according to the, what I've got here. So, um, so you go back, let's go back to the top of uh, Catterskill Falls. Now, unlike places like Taganic Falls, there are no railings, no walls, no overlooks, nothing that keeps people from going right to the top of the falls and running around. And the same thing down below, and climbing up all over the falls. And I didn't take pictures of people clambering around the falls here, but kids and families. And it just drives you, you know, you, you have a nervous breakdown looking at all the, the people um, around the falls who could fall off. In fact, somebody did this here and died. Um, and there's some warning signs that were recently put up. The last time I was there, they didn't even have these warning signs. So uh, it talks about how uh, people have actually lost their lives here. And I uh, met a man who was uh, looking around there, and he turned out to be a regional natural resource supervisor, a guy named Peter from uh, Region 4 of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And he was there uh, surveying the scene. They're actually planning to put up some conservative railings there, some, some split rail fence with some signs asking people to please not go beyond it and uh, risk their lives. Now, why don't they just put up something like that that we have at uh, Taganic Falls and the fences we have around the gorges to keep people from uh, going over into areas where they might get in trouble well, and, and fall in? Well, he explained to me that it was the, it's the forest preserve designation that prevents them from doing that. You basically can't do anything to block people's access to the forest preserve and uh, structures and so forth. So they're going to be, they're going to ask people not to go to the edge, but it is very dangerous. And uh, I didn't like being around there too long because of all the people that were blundering in on the area just to see, look over the edge of the falls and what have you. So uh, the top of Taganic Falls, of course, in this picture, is off limits. You can't go down in there legally. And of course, the overlook is uh, very well defined and made safe. So. Uh, so now we're going to take a, a, a little trip down the canyon from um, Catterskill Falls. This is the canyon that goes down. And go, well, you look the lower part of the picture, the canyon goes to the left and meets another canyon coming in the center of the picture, or actually center left, 
a much larger canyon, which is now you get down there, and this is called Catterskill Clove. Catterskill Clove. Now there are several cloves they call them in the the um, Catskills, and it's a word derived from an old um, Dutch term because this area, area was first settled by the Dutch in the early 15, 1600s, I'm sorry. And a clove is sort of a cleft in the mountains, a pass in the mountains. This is farther down, picture I took a few years ago, looking down into Catterskill Clove is this canyon that heads down from about 2,000 feet up around Haines Falls and Tannersville, New York, which is the area of the campground, down into to, uh, the flats, the lowland, and Palinville is the name of the town down there. And then it goes on. Uh, maybe another 15 miles to the Hudson River and the town of Catskill, which I visited. And in the down in the bottom there, in the center, is the uh, the bottom of the canyon, and it's very rugged in there. And it's Catterskill Creek, a neat place. And the highway goes down there. This is looking back at that highway. I think Highway 23A. Looking back, to the, obviously another time of year when I came through there. And right in the upper center of the picture, you can see the gap in the mountains there. That is Catterskill Clove. And it's uh, mountains uh, to the right. I think that's uh, South Mountain on the right. And then the left is the High Peak, Catterskill High Peak, and Round Top, it's called. Okay. So we're going to um, so we're gonna go back to the North Lake, South Lake area. Here we'll take a look at the view again of North Lake. And we'll zoom in and go right to, well, you look at North Lake there in the upper center and to the left of that where the beach area is and then just to the left of that on the brink of the of the precipice into the Hudson Valley. And we'll go up there and there's a sign, historical site, Catskill Mountain House. Well, this is the site of the Catskill Mountain House. Huh, where's the Catskill Mountain House? Well, it's not there anymore and I'm not going to read all this to you, but if you go there, you can read it, a lot of information. There's another old sign that has some pictures, historic pictures, and so forth. There's some seating that's been put in since the last time I was there. And there is an interpretive sign, a modern interpretive sign, that has some pictures and some text in it and some other stuff. Let's look at it a little more closely. Catskill Mountain House, a couple of... Uh, Paintings by Hudson River School painting painters, I call it. Back in the uh, uh, mid 1800s, there was a um, the first art movement, truly American art movement, got started in the Catskills, and it was called the later called the Hudson River School. Not that it was a, a an actual institution that you went to, but it was a um, uh, a movement and style of landscape painting that was uniquely American and all, it had a lot of European influences. And here's a picture of the Catskill Mountain House. I think this one was painted by Thomas Cole, who was said to be the, the originator of the Hudson River School style of painting. And here's another painting of the Catskill Mountain House. This was a luxury hotel built in the early 1800s, a couple hundred years ago, that overlooked this um, drop off to the Hudson Valley. You can see in the lower right, there's actually a carriage road that goes up to the uh, hotel. In fact, even a, a um, railroad was built straight up the mountainside. It was a, I forget what you call it, a funicular railroad or something like that. Here's some paintings. This might have been a um, Thomas Cole painting of North Lake and then the Catskill Mountain House in the left of center overlooking this incredible view. Another one, I think this is by a guy named Cropsey. Again, and this is definitely a Thomas Cole painting of the landscape there, the Catskill Mountain House, and it's dramatized. Uh, they didn't necessarily paint exactly what they saw, but they took elements of what they saw. They made, and particularly he did. He took sketches, and then later he would paint in his studio, and uh, they would throw in things and make them into a somewhat creative piece. Here's the Catskill Mountain House a hundred years ago, still going, but in decline. And this is what it looked like in 1953, falling apart. And it was uh, the state tried to keep it going and the uh, keep it the building together. And the um, uh, I guess various people wanted to uh, restore it, but it just became too much of a public hazard. So it was raised in I think the 1960s. Uh, so that was the end of the Catskill Mountain House. By the way, 
Speaking of Catterskill Falls, I want to show you my hat. This is what I picked up the last time I was there. Hike Catterskill Falls. I like to get hats as souvenirs from uh, where I, wherever I happen to be. So let's go back to that site again and look a little more, a little more closely at the pictures on that exhibit. This again was a Thomas Cole painting coming up the carriage road going to the Catskill Mountain House. And this painting was done, I believe, by Frederick Church, who was a um, student, one of the only students of Thomas Cole, um, of a sunrise from the Catskill Mountain House. And um, the, uh, at the Catskill Mountain House, each morning before sunrise, the tradition was a uh, bellhop or somebody went around and rang a bell to wake people up to get out there and watch the sunrise because it was really great. So um, this is a Frederick Church painting of the sunrise um, from the Catskill Mountain House. And his home, Olana, is a state historic site on the other side of the Hudson River. So um, I went up there before sunrise, and there's some people that actually camped up there. They were hiking through what's called the Escarpment Trail and the Long Path. And uh, this is what they were looking at, the sun rising over the Hudson River. Now, right in the center, sort of, uh, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, now, you really can't see it here, but the Hudson River is down there, sort of right center. There's a, a lighter area that is the Hudson River. And there were some other folks there uh, near the exhibit. They were sitting there. There were a couple from Long Island that were in the campground like I was. And um, so I talked to them a bit, and this is more of the sunrise as it rose above a bank of clouds on the eastern horizon. So we're going um, to look a little um, deeper into the story here. Go back to this exhibit, and you look at the uh, right-hand side of it, and there is this rubbing medallion where you can take rubbings, and it's a, uh, the Hudson River school art trail and there's a bunch of sites all around the um, the area where the Hudson River painters like to paint particularly Thomas Cole and if you go down in Catterskill Clove there's another one so I don't know there's maybe eight or ten of these things and uh, you can take rubbings or whatever you want to do and I've visited most of them from one time or another there's a little bit closer up of the Catterskill Clove sign on Route 23. That's also the way you, place you park to go in to hike to Catterskill Falls. And then I headed down out of the mountains through Catterskill Clove out to the Catskill Landing in the village of Catskill, right off the Hudson River at sea level. And this is where Thomas Cole first came up from New York City. And uh, in 1825, when he was about 24 years old, fell in love with the area and moved into this house eventually married the, uh, the niece of uh, the owner of the house and uh, did his painting. Now the house has been restored. I'm going to actually show you a quick little video about this place. Okay. ended it too soon there. Um, so the Thomas Cole House, uh, as that video showed, was uh, restored just uh, a few years ago and now is a Thomas Cole uh, National Historic Site. It's associated with the National Park Service but it's not a National Park Service site. And on that porch is the beginning of the tour. Here's overlooking the Catskill Mountains where Thomas Cole liked to look 
out of his uh, window. Actually, he painted a lot of his paintings. And this is these are the mountains right across where the Catskill Mountain House is. If you look on the extreme right of the of the horizon there, that dip in the mountains, that's where the Catskill Mountain House site is. And uh, so we'll go on the tour a little bit. He's inside the various rooms of the house and explaining his life. We went to his studio. You can see the whole story there. But I'm going to flip through. We're running out of time here, but I'm going to flip through a few of Thomas Cole's paintings. Of course, he inspired a whole couple of generations of painters, uh, Albert Bierstadt and Asher B. Durand. And there, was, there were quite a few of them across the state uh, and across the country, I should say. And the tradition went on until about the end of the 1800s and then petered out. But this is Catterskill Falls from uh, lower down. I'm not sure. This might be in between the two drops of the falls. And let's see what we've got here. Here's a view uh, along Catskill Creek looking back to the mountains. And another view of Catskill Creek, one of his paintings. He had, one of the sites is along Catskill Creek behind Main Street in the village of Catskill one of his favorite painting spots. So uh, another view, I think might, this might be in Catterskill Clove and in Catterskill Clove. These are incredible paintings. Some of the later painters were actually more um, detailed. He didn't go in for fine detail, but Asher Durand and Frederick Church uh, seemed to like to do very fine detail in their paintings. Again, looking at the Catskills from Catskill Creek. Here's one of his most famous paintings that uh, inspired uh, a lot of people uh, of Catterskill Falls. It's not totally true to the actual scene, but it's uh, um, one of the most famous, famous paintings by Thomas Cole. In the forest. That's pretty cool. Another one. I mo mainly chosen his Catskill landscape scenes, but he actually painted stuff in Europe and some imaginative things combining architectural and historical elements with landscapes. And a lot of people at that time in that the Hudson River School would do that. They were very free with mixing elements. Uh, they, were, they weren't just depictions of the landscape in front of them, but they were combinations of, of ideas that were incorporated in a landscape setting. So this is, um, actually this is one of my favorite uh, paintings and one of the most famous of the Hudson River School paintings. It's called Kindred Spirits, and I'm going to read you just a little bit about it. The Kindred Spirits is a painting by Archer B. Durand, a member of the Hudson River School of painter, Painters. It depicts the painter Thomas Cole, who had died in 1848, probably from pneumonia, and his friend, the poet William Cullen Bryant, in the Catskill Mountains. The landscape painting, which combines geographical features and Catterskill Clove and a minuscule depiction of Catterskill Falls is not a literal depiction of American geography, rather it is an idealized memory of Cole's discovery of the region more than 20 years prior. His friendship with Bryant and his ideas about American nature. In 1904, Bryant's daughter Julia donated the painting to the New York Public Library. In 2005, it was sold at auction to Walmart heiress Alice Walton for $35 million, a record for a painting by an American artist. The library was criticized for jettisoning part of the city's cultural patrimony, quote unquote, but the library defended its move, stating it needed money for its fund, uh, endowment fund. The painting was on display at the National Gallery of Art between 2005 and 2007. Currently, the painting is held in the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Bentonville, Arkansas. So that's the end of our story. We have to wrap it up here and. Uh, this episode 85, September 3rd, 2014. And um, thanks for joining me, and we'll see you again soon. Happy hiking.